Summer is heating up, the ballpark is packed, and there really is nothing like a home team advantage. That's why Team Toyota makes an obvious choice for your next vehicle purchase or service. With their MVP pricing guarantee, teammate rewards program, and streamlined customer experience, their award-winning sales and service departments are there for all of your vehicle needs. A home team advantage is nothing without family and community. Their employees are part of the family, part of your town, and we're all part of the team. Visit TeamToyota.net and choose one of their three locations in Langhorne, Glen Mills, or Princeton. Hey folks, thanks for listening to the Phillies Talk Podcast presented by Team Toyota. I'm Corey Seiben here in Bush Stadium in St. Louis. He's former Phillies closer Ricky Vitalico back in the studio. And Rick, four series left here after the Phillies finish up with the Cardinals, 15 games as we uh, go into Saturday. And the wild card picture, the Phillies remain atop, you know, leading the Cubs. That is two and a half games, really three and a half, given the tiebreaker. There have been times here in this month of September when it's looked like the Phillies were trending the opposite direction. But as we sit here, that top wild card spot, which comes with home field advantage in the first round, is looking pretty good for the Phillies. It, it is looking pretty good. You, you know what? The, the one thing that we have to understand is that there's so many ups and downs in this game. That's why they play 162 games, because there's going to be teams that have, that have struggles at times. Uh, the team has been inconsistent at times during the season, but then you look back to August and all that off the, all those offensive fireworks that they threw at us, and it makes you feel good about the team again. It, it, this is kind of what that team is. Every time they they kind of dig a wrench into you, they're like, "Okay, come on, come on," and then all of a sudden you kind of fall off on them. They make you come back again, and you know what? That's fine with me. I mean, drama is always good. Just not when the playoffs hit. I, I don't mind the drama during the season because it's a long season. The, these get the one thing that is concerning. I don't know about how you feel about this, but I am looking forward to the playoffs. I am looking ahead, and I'm worried about the bullpen. Uh, and I, I, you know, because playoff games, you're always going to need that bullpen to step up. And if those guys aren't there for you, it it could be a quick uh, playoffs, and that's not anything that anybody wants here in Philadelphia. And those guys are going to be relied on a ton in the postseason because beyond Zach Wheeler, you know, you could see the Phillies having their starting pitchers go five innings and that's it. Uh, we've seen three consecutive starts that Aaron Nola has been lifted in the fifth inning, four and a third, four and two thirds, four and two thirds. Uh, Rob Thompson earlier today from St. Louis saying that down the stretch, they're going to do everything they need to do to make the playoffs and then to keep winning, you know, to advance. That might mean shorter starts. It might mean going to a high leverage reliever in the fifth inning. I mean, look at last October, for example. When Jose Alvarado, in half of his appearances, entered in the sixth inning or earlier, you know, Rob Thompson was ready to push that button. And it's a big topic because, you know, Aaron Nola in this series opener in St. Louis did not pitch well again, get, didn't get through five innings. He wasn't satisfied with his performance. A career low one strikeout through 97 pitches, only five swinging strikes. So the stuff wasn't what we're used to seeing out of Aaron Nola. But the fact that this has happened three times in a row as, you know, the playoffs are approaching. It's a bit of a different story than it was this time last year for Aaron Nola when he seemed like he was conquering those September demons. And it seems like everybody's just waiting. And, and, and it's it's an odd situation for Nola because we're not used to this. We're used to him. Let, let, let's face it. His M.O. is going deep, deep into the into games, uh, you know, going six, seven innings when he can. And now that battle to get through five is becoming an issue. Not a good time. It, the, the, the timing is bad on this whole situation for him. I mean, he's throwing a lot of pitches, so his so it, it has nothing to do with that. What it has to do with is getting outs early in the count. I, I really believe this. I think Aaron Nola, once he start, if he starts trusting his stuff again, he can get quick outs. He he's got the stuff. I don't think there's any doubt about it. But there's certain games where he's been flat. Last uh, you look at last night's game in St. Louis, flat. Um, and when you don't have the put away stuff, you have to find another way to get people out. And that's one thing that he's struggled with. He struggled with almost sometimes you, you've heard the, the whole thing about pitchers pitching backwards. They didn't have their best stuff. So they changed uh, their patterns. They went in a different direction. You don't normally see that from Aaron Nola or hear that about Aaron Nola. And he really hasn't been able to make adjustments. You know, I always talk, you've heard me talk about this last year and year, in years past since Zach Wheeler has gotten here. 
the one thing that's a saving grace for him is that when he doesn't have his best stuff, he's able to make adjustments within an out, within an inning, you know, within that game. And that's one thing that Aaron Nola has not been able to do at all. We, we really don't. Once Aaron Nola starts going bad in the game, it usually stays that way. He doesn't go bad in like the second inning and then throw seven scoreless after that. He goes bad in an inning and he can't seem to find himself after that. He's really got to work on the mental aspect of the game right now and trying to focus on how could I be better when things go bad. And we haven't seen that from Aaron. This is a guy that has every tool in the world. He's got a real good, he's got a good fastball that he can locate. He's got a really good uh, curveball, but he falls in love with it a little too much. I think relying on the changeup at times when he needs to in curveball counts can kind of help him out in situations and throwing the changeup uh, fastball backwards. But he has not gotten to that point. Yeah, I mean, men on base this season, his opponent's batting average is 291 compared to like 200 with the bases empty. Once he gets guys on base, things really seem to, you know, speed up for him. And with the pitch clock, as we've been mentioning all season, he's a guy who's been impacted more than most. And, you know, Nola must be frustrated right now because it seems to be like lately, at least, something different each start. Early in the season, the first half, it was easy to identify what was going on. He was allowing far too many home runs. He wasn't putting many guys on base, but the guys that were getting on base were trotting around the bases. and. Um, lately though, last night, lack of swing and miss stuff. Sometimes it's been walks. Sometimes it's been home runs. Sometimes it's been like getting to two strikes and not being able to finish somebody off. You just wonder, like, it, there, there have been comparisons made. I've been hearing people talk about like 2009 Cole Hamels. Remember Cole Hamels that year after the Phillies won the yeah. World Series where he made a comment late that he couldn't wait for the season to end. I mean, not that Nola has said that or anything, but has such a similar vibe. That's when everybody started getting on Cole for being on the chicken banquet. <laughs> going out having too much chicken at the banquets. So, I, I mean, it, it could have something to do with going deep last year. But I think I think you're right in the sense that it has a lot to do with the pitch clock. And I hate to tell everybody, the pitch clock's not going away. W there may be some tweaks here and there to it. But w what's going to happen is that you have younger players that are just getting into the major league level that have been using that throughout the minor leagues. So it doesn't even – I mean, they don't even think about it anymore. And quite frankly, have you heard anything about a pitch clock from anybody in the last three months? I mean, no. if anybody, it's been, you know, Rob Thompson talking about Aaron Nola, that he's having a hard time, you know, still getting through the pitch clock thing. Somehow, some way, you just got to forget about it. You just got to go out and pitch. And when runners get on base, how, how about bearing down on the hitter? I think he worries so much about that runner on first base that he may steal second base that he takes his mind off of what – off of where it should be it should be on the catcher's mitt and making the right pitch instead of the guy on first base i mean sometimes in this game nowadays you got to give up the stolen base but you got to be able oh. to focus on the catcher's mitt yeah especially now when the stolen base success rate is like 85 percent or whatever higher than it's ever been because yeah. of the rule changes uh so what do you think of this this uh, adjustment to the rotation michael lorenzen is going to be piggybacking christopher sanchez the next turn through it's going to be sanchez tuesday night in atlanta with Lorenzen behind him. It sounds like Sanchez is in play for like four or five innings, Lorenzen multiple innings behind him. You know what? Here's my theory. What What if Christopher Sanchez is pitching well? I mean, are you well, really I, I, out of the game? I asked Rob Thompson that question earlier. I said, does that mean that he's going to go, is he going to be shorter leash? You know, because we've seen Sanchez go six innings, seven innings in recent starts. So what if he is at six inning, one run? Uh, but it does sound like the fact that these guys are so far beyond their career highs and in innings that's factoring in for the Phillies. Sanchez is like 40 innings past his prior high mark, and they also want him to be able to contribute in October. I, I, I wonder if the, if the theory – I mean, uh, Lorenzen has pitched out of the bullpen before, so I don't, I don't think there's there's not much of a thought process in that, and I, I bet you it played into who goes into the bullpen right now. I bet you it played a big role in that. And, I, and I'm wondering – I'm wondering what else is going to play a role in whoever goes to the bullpen during the playoffs. Because I'm looking at tonight. I, I think the piggyback thing is great. Uh, okay, you want to do that. You want to save some guys' arms. You want to save their innings for the season. That's fine if, if that's the only reason you're doing it. But I have a hard time doing that if Christopher Sanchez goes in there. He's through five, giving up one hit and no runs. And it's a close game. I have a hard time just saying, oh, we'll just throw Lorenzen in there, see what he's going to do now. 
you're you're still in a race here, and it's a race to the number one wild card. It's not a race to the. Uh, they're going to make the playoffs. I think we all agree with that. They're going to make the playoffs. But this is a race to have home field advantage. This is a race to have people at Citizens Bank Park the first week of, of October. And to me, you you have to go with what's working. And number one, if if you're in a one nothing game and Christopher Sanchez is pitching, I have a hard time believing that Rob Thompson's going to take him out of that game. I really do. And I, no matter what he says now, I have a hard time believing that. And getting back to the playoff picture, I still think right now one two is Wheeler and Nola. Uh, you know, I I just think that's Rob Thompson's way. Um, but the number three, I thought it would be. Taiwan Walker, but I think this start tonight for Ranger could be a big, it could shift the tides. I don't know how you feel about that. Ranger p- pitched extremely well in his last game, uh, taking a no-hitter into the seventh inning, and he had all his pitches going. He, he he had his fastball in the inside part of the plate to the right-handers, right on point. His changeup was outstanding, and his curveball was what I would call the sneaky one. Because he would mix it in there on one, two, two, two counts and all of a sudden get himself a strikeout. So right now I'm wondering if Ranger pitches well tonight, does that kind of change the tides of who goes in that number three spot in the playoffs? Yeah, I mean, right now the Phillies do seem to have more confidence in Suarez than they do in Walker. Uh, The matchup against the Cardinals, Ricky and I are sitting down to record this Saturday going into game two. It is a good matchup for Suarez and he lines up to make two more starts after that in the regular season against the Mets and the Pirates, two more outings that could you know, set him up for some success. There's also something to be said about splitting up. You know, if you, you could go to Ranger Suarez in a game two to split up the righties and lefties, don't know how much of consideration that's going to be. A lot of it's going to be determined by how Aaron Nola pitches down the stretch as well. Um, but yeah, Suarez, his last time out, to your point, that was probably the best changeup we've seen from him all year. Struck out a career high 10 batters against the Marlins. Uh, and well, he was the guy who shifted all over the place last year and the year before in terms of rotation, closing, long relief. It sounds like this year he's more solidified as a starter heading into the playoffs because the Phillies need him in that role. I mean, ideally, Taiwan Walker would be your number three because that's what he was paid to come in here and do, $72 million. Does not have the same experience relieving as some of these other guys. But, I mean, we just haven't seen what we needed to see. I, would, I think you would agree the last handful of starts from Walker, right? Well, you're going to need – Two, start, two other starters for that second series because most likely if Wheeler and Nola go and if Ranger has to go, then all of a sudden you are you're you still need another starter mixed in for that next series, which I wouldn't doubt if it was Taiwan Walker at that point. But I, I look at it this way. What have you done for me lately? Isn't that, that the way that, that Rob Thompson should be thinking right now? Which is why I'm kind of going down the road of Ranger Suarez right now. Look, he was out for a a period of time. He had his lulls during the season, um, and there was some concern. Ranger had, what, the one good month of June, I believe, he was outstanding. And then all of a sudden, he was a different guy in July. So, to me, you got to get him back. If he gets back to form, that's a guy who's hot, and that's a guy you want to stick with. And I'm sure Rob Thompson's hoping, you know what, hey, maybe we don't even get to a game three in in uh, in a wild card series, but my, my whole point is that you need that number three starter. And I think you need to really grade them right now. And I'm, and I'm talking about Ranger and, and Taiwan Walker. Obviously, Lorenzen is most likely out of that. And then, I, I mean, even Christopher Sanchez. But I think Sanchez is going to get the push away because of what happened with Bailey Falter last year. Okay, well, after the Phillies finish up here in St. Louis, Rick, they move on to Atlanta. And that series against the Braves earlier this week, I mean, it was interesting because the Phillies' offense really did stand toe-to-toe with the Braves. I mean, that Braves' offense can set the, the major league record probably in home runs, like the deepest lineup we've ever seen in the history of baseball, honestly, you compare some of the numbers to the very best offenses ever. Um, the Phillies lost that series, but they probably did remind themselves that they can hit some of those pitchers, and that's relevant because beyond this week, if they were to advance beyond the wild card round, they're most certainly going to face the Braves. Yeah, um, you have to stand toe to toe with those guys. They're going to score. I, I think that's the one thing that you have to put in your head. The Braves are going to score some runs. So what do you need to do? Well, you need to stand toe to toe. It's like a prize fight. Two heavyweights going at it. Just keep beating each other up and see who ends up on top. I, I don't. 
you know what? In all honesty, like I'm not, it, it, you know, you think about teams that you're afraid to face. I don't think I want to see the Marlins. Isn't that weird? Because I look at the Marlins and they have some really good starting pitchers, although Alcantara has been injured. But still, they it's a lot of low scoring games when you play the Marlins. So that makes me a little nervous. You get in a slugfest, I'd rather see it's Phillies team in a slugfest. So, I, I mean, I'd rather see the Braves and, and see what you could do against them. At least they know what they're going to get with the Braves. You never know with the Marlins what you're going to get. You, you don't really even know the Cubs because you didn't see them when, when they were playing this well. So, I, I mean, th- there's, there's teams out there that are, I mean, that are a little confusing, you know? I mean, Arizona's playing well now. Who knows who's going to get in this thing? But, I mean, my whole thing is you go up against the Braves, you got to be ready to play every night. But you're going to be ready to play because you know that it's going to be one of those one of those slugfests. And, and I think the Phillies almost, they want that. I think you want the Braves, in, in a sense, if you're playing in those games because you know that it's, a, that it's a prize fight, that you know it's a title fight. And quite frankly, whoever wins that series, because that's it's going to come down to that at some point, I think whoever wins that goes to the World Series and has a better chance of any American League team to win it right now. Well, you know, talking about like starting pitching as you just did with Miami, you know, the other team in the wild card race that would apply to is the Diamondbacks. Because if you get into a three game series against them, you're probably going to see Zach Gallon game one, Merrill Kelly game two, you know, two of the better right handers in the National League. And that could stifle a lot of different lineups. Uh, is there a particular team that you think the Phillies match up best with in that wild card round? Uh, best with. I want to say the Cubs, but I haven't seen enough of them right now to say, yeah, I'm really comfortable. Let's go get the Cubs. Um, I don't like the Marlins matchup just because they're gnats. They're they're pain in the butt. Every time you face them, uh, Phillies have not, you know, played great against them this season. So th- there's always that kind of concern. Plus, they have some confidence going in against the Phillies. I th- I'm I'm gonna say the Cubs, and that's hopefully what it ends up being. I'm gonna th- I'm gonna say the Cubs. I I think the Cubs coming in here might be the best matchup for the Phillies. I think the Phillies have a little too much firepower for them. Yeah, and like when you look at some of these other teams, Cincinnati Reds, for example, they were like a media darling team in the middle of the season. They've been floundering for the last like I don't know two months, and that's a young team. You don't know how far you know they're gonna be able to make it if they do make the playoffs. Like, is this team gonna be like a taste for them, or are they gonna be able to? actually win games. I think that would be a pretty good match for the Phillies as well. Uh, Ricky, thanks a lot for joining the Phillies Talk Podcast. Thanks a lot to all of you listening and watching on YouTube. Phil's finishing up with the Cardinals here and then moving on to a big three-game series in Atlanta before they return home. So we'll see if they can pick up another series win here. Catch you guys later in the week.